it's amazing like all the lies and deception and how sneaky he was and he was still considered the greatest of all time he really had to do like whatever he could to get to the top Hey everyone, welcome to Painting in the Past, a series where I paint something and talk about the past. Now we usually talk about artists, but I came across this name and I was thinking, why have we never talked about art dealers before? Because in a way, they're not as important as artists, but they play a crucial role in how art is ingrained in our society. So today we're going to be talking about someone who is considered the most influential art dealer of all time, Joseph Duveen. Now I feel like that's like a pretty big claim, so let's see if he really lived up to the name. So Joseph was born above his parents' antique shop in 1869 and would really go on to change the relationship America had with art. His father had moved to England in his 20s and had started an antique shop business where he would travel back and forth from the Netherlands to source Dutch teapots, teacups, different stemware, returning to England to resell them. He would eventually graduate to medieval tapestries, different glassware, expensive furniture, so more higher end objects. And within three years, he would meet his wife, Rosetta, and the two would move to the apartment above the antique shop. But anyways, Joseph was the oldest of 15 kids. That's a lot of kids. That's three different basketball teams on the court. <laughs> so Joseph would go on to drop out of high school to help his father with the business. And his uncle would also work for the family business. And then in 1879, the family would trade their shop in Hull for a storefront in London. And Joseph's father quickly became the most sought after decorator in London. After a bout of pneumonia, Joseph's father would end up beginning to leave England every like fall and escape the cold and come back when it was warmer. And his uncle had gone to New York. So this left Joseph alone to run the family business. Now, it is said that a lot of Joseph's success is credited to a simple observation he had, which this is actually really interesting to me because I didn't think of it this way, but it's actually true for the time. He said, Europe has a great deal of art and America has a great deal of money. Basically meaning take the art from Europe and sell it to Americans and they'll pay much more money than the Europeans. So your basic supply and demand concept. So between this observation and just really good timing, Joseph became really, really successful very quickly at selling and dealing art. By the end of the 19th century, new technology made it really easy to import and export different goods which led to a global abundance in grain and would end up causing Europe to go into a depression. This meant a lot of British aristocrats were scrambling for money, so they started selling their priceless heirlooms and artwork at a very cheap price. And this was Joseph's time to shine. So he literally bought the art for a low price and sold them for a high price to Americans who had more money than the Europeans. And the so-called floodgates for Joseph's success really opened when prestigious art collector Rudolf Kahn died in 1905, leaving his entire collection, including Van Eyck's, Vermeer's, Rembrandt's, all of it up for sale. And who swooped in? You guessed it, Joseph did. And he bought all of it. He got a really good deal, honestly. For all of this work, he ended up working out a payment plan of $4 million, which is mm, about $107 million today, I think. So he got all these works for a steal. Because depending which one it is, like one of these paintings could be $20 million. And he got like more than 10 of them. He would then go on to sell different pieces of this work, some for a million, some for a quarter of a million, some for 2.5 million, half a million. So as you can see, his wealth is just racking up. 
And especially if Europe was in a depression at the time, he goes to America, makes all this money, comes back, lives in Europe. It's a lot of money. <laughs> It would be a lot of money by like today's standards. So you can imagine as back then with inflation, he's sitting on a golden egg here. He really is. So just like that, obviously, Joseph had made all his money back that he had previous loss from the depression, which really helped him further the business. And obviously he would put a lot of that money back into the business. So he would use a lot of his wealth to acquire more pieces. And by 1912, Joseph would hire Bernard Berenson, who was already Isabella Stewart Gardner's personal advisor on all things Renaissance. And Joseph hired him to be his personal authenticator for paintings, which this would also prove to be a very good business decision as when things are authenticated, they're worth more because they are proven to be the real thing instead of them not being authenticated. So there's a chance they could be fake. So you can't get as much money for them. So the same year with World War I on the horizon, Joseph would officially move from London to New York City. And he would buy a place on Fifth Avenue, and this would quickly become his little home to all his operations, which would prove to be immensely successful if they weren't already. And it was at this point that he became the biggest art dealer the world had ever seen. So Joseph was different than other art dealers because he really ended up buying like every piece of art he came in contact with, including illustrations and sketches, whereas other art dealers would only purchase finished paintings or finished pieces. Now, this was definitely a really good decision. I don't know if he did it on purpose or what, but if you've ever looked into any famous artists, their sketches, like Leonardo da Vinci, his sketchbook, or like Michelangelo's sketches, stuff that was usually like thrown away is actually so valuable now because people love the behind the scenes of everything. So this man, Joseph was not only just an art dealer to people, but he became their art advisors. So not only are they paying him to sell them artwork, but they're paying for his advice, which means he was making money on top of money on top of money. And he also would buy artwork from estates, which this is very smart because some of the time when people pass and all their stuff is left to an estate, they just have someone come in and sell it, clear it, get rid of it all. And they may not necessarily know the value of something where an art dealer comes in and obviously he knows what he's looking at. So he's going to get a really good deal on these paintings and this work, which means his profit is going to be bigger. But here's where the sneaky part comes in. It was said that Joseph was actually happy to pay off butlers and chauffeurs who worked for people who were in possession of these famous works. No one really knows what came out of this, but I'm sure some pieces went missing or like, you know, something happened. They worked out some deal. Maybe when the person died, he would be able to buy it and he'd cut the butler a nice little check. I don't really know, but some sneaky, maybe unethical business was going on. And then he also used this to find out who was in the market for art. So he would find out from these butlers and chauffeurs, like if they heard anything that someone was in the market for art, then he'd swoop in perfect timing. How'd that happen? Yeah, that's basically the same as like using someone's likeness or their name to like grow your fame, essentially, or make money off of it. As you can imagine, with any shady activity, there is bound to be a lawsuit that happens. And it did. Joseph had employed much of a ruthless strategy to turn a potential customer into a definite customer, which was Henry Clay Frick. And what he did was basically claim that the works Henry had previously bought were fakes to be able to sell him real paintings. 
as opposed to the fake CM. So this tactic landed Joseph on the wrong side of a $575,000 lawsuit, which seems like not insane amount of money by today's standards, but I remind you what time period we're in. So this is actually like $14 million today. So quite the insane lawsuit we have on our hands. But despite all this, which I don't even understand, Henry became a loyal customer of Joseph. What? That doesn't even make any sense, but I guess whatever works. And by the time Henry ended up moving into a new mansion, Joseph was his personal art advisor and would sell him many things for his new place. By the 1930s, Joseph began selling directly to museums which this was really a game changer for him as many more people were looking at the work he was dealing. And then unfortunately one morning while in one of his favorite rooms at Claire Ridges, Joseph had passed away due to a cerebral hemorrhage. But he really impacted the amount of art and what famous art entered into America and is responsible for some of the most famous art sales. I think the power kind of really got to his head because then he was quoted as saying, Keep alive, find me great things, I can sell them. So this just kind of goes to show he had a little ego, but I guess you have to to be the top dog. 